The Reverie, ladies and gentlemen. This seven-day conference is held every four years atop the red line in the awe-inspiring city of the founders of the world government, Marie Joam, Marie Joam, Mary Jelly, the Holy Land. All of the kingdoms that are allied with the world government come together here to discuss political and current events. However, this reverie may be the most important out of all of them prior, and very well may in fact be the last reverie ever held. Ooh, that narration was spooky. I wonder what he meant by that. I don't know, and I'm the one that was narrating it. Hey everybody, Teching 101 here, and welcome back to Reverie! Reverie dance! You know, revelry can also mean like you're happy, you know, you're like, oh, you're you're dancing in revelry. That's just great, okay. Well, um, anyway, yeah, this will be One Piece chapter 906 review titled The Holy Land Marie. Joa Marie Joa. Okay, all right, all right. Look, 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 look. Before we even get into the pronunciation war, every everyone's getting ready. They're like their fingers are hot at their keyboards. Like, let's do this. I've been pronouncing it Marie Joa for a long time, so don't get your hopes up on me stopping the pronunciation and changing it up. I, I don't even know if I'm right. I can't tell. Maybe I am. I don't know, but um, I'm probably not going to change the pronunciation up. Maybe I'll refer to it more as the Holy Land from now on and just kind of avoid the name altogether, but yeah, let's just let's just go with that. So the cover page is continuing on the grand adventures of Orlumbus the Adventurer. This time we see what his daily life is like at 10 a.m. So he wakes up and he, you know, he folds his pajamas Pajamas, like a true gentleman, and now he's inspecting the ship, going around like, oh, there's a little bit of a spot of dust here, Swabby. Uh, also, we get to see, I, I'm assuming it's his first mate, this is a character that's been mentioned before, so, Columbus is obviously named after Columbus, you know, the explorer, you know, in 1492, Columbus arrived in the Americas and, you know, slaved and slaughtered a bunch of indigenous people. Um, but uh, there's actually a character named Columbus, that, you know, the, actually just Columbus on Columbus's crew, and it's a little lolly girl that beats the crap out of anybody that dares to not swab the deck good enough. So, uh, yeah, still kind of a step up from the actual Columbus of, of history, you know? So that's that. Um, don't really know what the whole story is there between the two, what relationship they have, but there you go. I'm not even 100% sure if this is a girl, but... We're, we're just gonna roll with it. Alright, so, um, moving on to the arrival of the, uh, Ryugu Kingdom royalty. You know, you got Neptune, you got, uh, Fukuboshi, Ryuboshi, Manboshi, and Shirahoshi all arriving at the top of the net, uh, the red line. Well, nearing the top of the red line. See, how this is going to work is, uh, I don't even know why I have my Sabo hat on. Sabo does not even appear in this chapter. Well, he kind of does, but he's still in the armor, so we don't get to see him. The revolutionaries really do nothing in this entire chapter. Anyway, um, it's more about just, like, a meet and greet getting to see all of the characters it's been a while since we've uh, you know seen in the story but anyway yeah so uh nearing the top of the red line that's actually where the bondolas stop so they don't just get off on the very tippy top what happens is um this is the very tippy top of the red line where the holy land is located here's where the bondolas stop and then there's like a grand staircase where everybody that arrives there has to has to walk up and i think i have an idea for why that is uh but first let's talk about this little moment where upon arriving near the top of the red line, the guards inform the merfolk um, that they have to replace their bubbles that they were currently using with the reinforced ones. Otherwise, they will not work in this like level of atmosphere, okay? So, obviously, because merfolk like Fukuboshi and Shirahoshi, they do not have legs, they cannot walk, so they have to use those bubble rings in order to move around. But they're stating that in this level of airspace, those things simply won't be durable enough and they'll pop. So they have to replace them with specialized bubbles and this kind of makes sense given from what we've seen with the last chapter um kind of pokes a hole in my idea my idea is that the mother tree eve was like right around the center of the red line and that's why these bubbles are a little bit more durable than the other ones but no it's it's been stated before back at Sabaondi that in fact bubbles can be reinforced to be a little bit more durable and the bubbles that we saw in Sabaondi that were just popping those were just naturally created ones but if you really wanted to you can reinforce them so they could 
could last longer. I still think they need to be in a very specific climate in order to work because if bubbles could be reinforced and they could just be, they could last as long as they want wherever they want, then that would be, you, we would see them all over the place. We would see bubble technology all over the world. We don't. I still think there needs to be a specific climate for it. It's just that because they're so high up into the, uh, well, I don't exactly know how high up they are because we're not high to the point where we're seeing like the White Sea or the White White Sea. So the White Sea is about 7,000 meters up and the White White Sea is 10,000 meters. So we're probably like just below that, maybe like five or 6,000 meters up. Still extremely high, but not high enough that, you know, Sky Islands are now like you're, you're seeing them in the distance or whatever. In fact, remember when the Straw Hats first arrived at the White Sea and they met Gonfall? Gonfall mentioned that there was actually another way to get to the White Sea that's the standard and the Straw Hats taking the knock upstream. That, that was the dangerous route. That was the one where he's like, holy shit, I can't believe people are still taking that. You mean to tell me that you guys actually rode on a current that's shooting straight up? How psychotic are you people? Nobody does that anymore. And Nami's freaking out like, oh my god, you mean there was another way up here the entire time? Gonfall mentions that, yes, there's a place called the Summit of High West. Now keep in mind, because Gonfall is from the sky, they have different names for everything. So they don't actually call, like, the Grand Line the Grand Line. They just call it the Blue Sea. And everybody from there, they don't refer to them as, like, humans or giants. They're just like, oh, you're Blue Sea people. This is one time where the, well, the, the old school Funimation dub, which was coming off of the Four Kids dub, they actually had something cool. They called them Gravity Blue Riders, which I thought was a lot cooler than just Blue Sea people. But anyway, yeah. So even, let, let's say the Red Line is this high west place that Gonfall was talking about, it would make sense. I mean, so far it's the highest point that we've seen in the One Piece world. Maybe not exactly the area where the Holy Land is, but, you know, the red line stretches across the entire world at, like, the prime meridian, so you can probably climb up to a certain point of it. There's probably some parts that are higher than others. There might be a, a section of the of the red line that's even higher than where Marie, Marie Joie is, and then that's how you gain access to the White Sea under normal circumstances. Maybe. Maybe that's what Gonfall was alluding to, but yeah, I'm getting kind of off topic here. I'm talking about Sky Islands. Episode of Sky Island is airing this August, so I gotta start building the hype somehow. Forgive me. But yeah, they gotta reinforce the bubbles in this particular atmosphere level, so okay, great. Not a big deal, but I like that Oda mentioned it. There are still bubbles off to the side that are reaching up that high, but you don't see many beyond that point. Like, there's a perimeter where they all start popping. So that, that may be one of the reasons why the staircase exists there, why you can't just get off at the very top of the red line, because the the bubbles won't make it, although they do have reinforced bubbles, so they probably could easily get the bondolas up all the way. I think the main reason that staircase exists is because you see along the sides of the staircases a bunch of statues that are just, you know, giant-sized and staring down. Like, we see all the people ascending the staircase, including, like, Neptune and Shirahoshi, who are huge, and this, you know, they're just little tiny dots. This staircase is giant. These statues are giant. So, what are these statues? They don't get really referenced at all. They're just like, oh wow, this place is really epic. It's really pretty. I'm gonna bet dollars to donuts. Those statues right there are the original kings that founded the world government. And I bet when people arrive at the Holy Land, the world government and the Tenryubito, they want the people to like walk up this super long staircase and just kind of like, oh yeah, these are these are the guys. These are the people. You know, you got, you got a long, you know, stretch of a uh, stairwell to walk up and kind of like ruminate on how powerful that these kings were. They created everything that you see before you. It's all them. So given the amount of propaganda and everything in the world government, that wouldn't that wouldn't surprise me if the whole reason they stuck that giant staircase there that people like, like Steli at the probably the end of this, you know he's not really a physically fit kind of guy. He's like, oh shit, oh god, holy crap. It's like that scene in um, House Movie Castle where the Witch of the Waste has to walk up the stairs and it's just, it's just painful to watch. It's like, ah, but um, yeah, that, that's the staircase. So after upon, uh, you know, reaching the top of that, they are now on the top of the red line proper, one of the high highest locations in all of One Piece, and this is the grand introduction of the Holy Land, Marie Joie. That's when Oda actually adds the caption of what, how the actual pronunciation, well, I don't know about the pronunciation, but the spelling of it anyway. Here you go. 
Um, yeah, and it's the same castle we've seen before in, in various angles, just never really seen the entire city in grand scope. Um, the castle itself is giant. It's much bigger than any other building in the entire town, and that's kind of an understatement, okay? Because the other, like, the first time I saw this, I thought all Marijois was was just that castle. I actually had to stop and look that, no, there are other buildings, probably like other cathedrals and stuff in the town popping out. It's just this castle is so damn big that it eclipses everything else in this entire city. All right, it, this place looks like, looks, it looks like a little farm village right next to this giant castle, but we know that's not the case. This is the, the Holy Land. It's an actual city just with a giant castle looming over it. So upon arriving in the outskirts of the city, there's a thing called the Travelator, which is basically just a movable walkway. You, you know, you see it in all the futuristic kind of movies. You step on it, and it's just like, oh, well, this is convenient. Um, it's just a normal, like, you know, brick-patterned road that they step on, and then the ground moves forward, and Steli begins freaking out. He's like, oh, my God, is this an earthquake? Ah, someone protect me, please. I'm a scared little boy. And they're like, no, dude, this is just a, it's a movable walkway. You're fine. So everyone starts, like, you know, like, oh, this is pretty cool. This is technology. Um, however, they also bring up, uh, Fukuboshi does, he's like, hey, look, there's a, there's a forest over there, Shirahoshi, and they mention the forest is artificially planted, probably because, I don't know how hospitable the top of the red line is, you know, with that level of climate and the, maybe the lack of oxygen. That's something that doesn't get brought up, you know, like, how high up they are, and they, you know, even, like, somebody that's, like, Steli, who is used to a certain amount of, uh, you know, luxury and doesn't probably work out very much, and, and you know, he's in the Goa Kingdom his whole life, now all of a sudden he's 5,000, 6,000 meters above the freaking sea level. He's like, <gasps> you know, he should be like struggling to breathe right now or have like a bubble on his head or something, but uh, they, they never bring it up. So we're just going to assume that that's, that that's not a case right now or oh, who knows, maybe the entire city is conditioned so people can can breathe in it. It, it. It's the level of technology that could exist in One Piece. It's fine. But um, yeah, they basically say, uh, you know, let, let's not take the travel later movable walkway. Let's let's go the old fashioned way. And that way, you know, Shirahoshi wanted to see the forest, right? And Shirahoshi's like, yeah, OK, sure, we'll do that. Um, what I was going to say before I got a little bit off track, because I don't know if a forest could naturally exist on the red line because it's just, it looks like just a big rocky continent. You know, we don't know how hospitable it is. But anyway, yeah, so they go that way. And um, Fukuboshi, in the meantime, is like, hmm, I have a bad feeling about this. You know, I've, uh, I've been on uh, Fishman Island my whole life. And uh, after the whole incident with Horty, I kind of have a sort of slavey vibe going on here. And it turns out his his suspicion was correct because we find out right in the next panel that there is an underground section of Marijois where the uh, the travelators, the uh, the movable walkways are actually moved by slave labor in the you know most uh, like simple way possible. Basically just a bunch of slaves that are strung up into uh, chains and stuff and then are just moving the walkway forward. Like so it's, uh, you know, like here's the walkway and it just goes around and like, you know, that kind of fashion, you know, again and again, and there's a person there whipping them, and he's like, you know, keep it at easy pace, it has to be a pleasant ride, and we see one of the slaves there that's just like, oh, please kill me, please, if you can't, I mean, if you can't rescue me, just kill me, I don't even want to be here anymore, so, we've, we've already known this, this should not come as a shock to anybody, I think it's Oda just kind of giving us an idea, as like, yeah, this is the way the culture is, you have all of the rich and powerful living in a wash luxury, and they're sitting there, you know, sipping their wine atop this giant castle and gilded opulence, you know, gold everywhere, diamonds everywhere. Meanwhile, they, there's an entire underbelly of the city, which is being just completely uh, run by slave labor, essentially. And hey, I would not, hey, because that was mentioned that this entire undersection exists, hey, revolutionaries, Sabo breaks in, frees all the slaves, causes chaos, Fisher Tiger 2.0. It could totally happen. Totally. That's a total possibility. Hey, that's, that's one way to declare war against the Tenryu Bito. Free all their slaves. And you know what? I'm sure Oda wouldn't go into this because it's kind of dark, but I'm sure some of these slaves would probably choose to just jump off the red line as to either continue to be slaves because some of the conditions are pretty bad. Like, not even just these conditions, which just, like, like I think, the, honestly, I think the ones that are just stuck underground forced to move a walkway, compared to some of the other stuff we've seen slaves having to deal with, um, and particularly the, the kind of stuff that's implied to have happened to, like, Hancock and her sisters while being in prison at Marijois, I think these guys are kind of getting the light end of the spectrum. 
spectrum. You know what I mean? Some really messed up stuff goes down here. So, um, yeah, we're going to see how it goes. Also, um, because Hancock was the ruler of an island, I've heard some people asking, like, oh, maybe she'll appear at Reverie. Nah, nah, nah. Two reasons. Number one, I don't think she would ever step into Marie Joie again. And number two, she doesn't care. So, uh, yeah, she, it's not going to happen. We're not going to see Hancock in this arc. Although, that would have completed the, the, the Luffy harem team hyper force go thing perfectly but unfortunately i don't think we're gonna get that so uh yeah we um then cut over to a certain resident of a tenry ubito and it's actually charlos the guy that luffy ko'd back at sab Odi, who punt who uh, shot hachi and then you know he punched him and you know that's the whole issue with kizaru arriving on the island so charlos is still around and it doesn't seem like um luffy decking him right in the cheek really changed much about his personality he's still the same asshole we always we always knew he was He's watching the new arrivals through a pair of binoculars from his house, and he sees Shirahoshi. And we always, we already saw what Charlos is with, uh, with mermaids. The whole reason he wanted to buy Kami was to throw her in his uh, like piranha tank or something. I want to see how long she survives. Ooh. Yeah. So, um, if you ever needed a reason specifically why Charlos is a grade A douche nozzle, that's the reason. Uh, I think that most people would go with. And so he's watching Shirahoshi like, oh, Father, Father, come over here. There's a giant woman there. I want her! So, um, yeah, can someone please push him off the side of the mountain in this in this arc? That, that would be great. I mean, we already saw Luffy. You know what? I'm just gonna throw this up, and so we could just bask in this for a second. Like, oh, yeah, that was such an epic moment. Luffy just like, I don't care about freaking diplomacy or politics. I don't care if they bring down an ancient weapon on me. You shot my friend and just, ah! Oh! Such a good scene in One Piece. All right. Well, now we cut to the front of Marie Joie Castle proper. Giant immaculate place. You got a huge gate opening up, all that crap. And then there's a kind of like a vestibule area, like a socializing plaza inside of the castle, actually. Um, because the thing is just so big, you could probably fit another city just in the castle walls. And you see all the people that are arriving, not just the kings, but also all of their uh, retainers and all their bodyguards are there. And they state that... Um, the conference is going to last seven days, so a whole week of reverie, and I'm sure not the, the, the whole thing is probably not just meetings. In fact, the only time we've seen reverie up to this point, we just cut to like a meeting that was being held, but seven days. I'm feeling like there might be some other kind of stuff going on here where uh, they do things beyond just meeting. There might be actually some really messed up kind of ritualistic stuff they do just to kind of sit around and be like, we're awesome! We're in power! Look up, um... Bohemian Grove. It's a gathering that occurs with a bunch of world leaders out in California every uh, every year or so. And um, there, there's a lot of like conspiracy theories, m you know, mixed in with it. And I don't really buy all of them. But one thing they do at Bohemian Grove is they have this giant effigy of a of like an owl thing. It's called Care, and then they burn it, and that got people thinking like they're a bunch of Satanists. You know, I'm not really I'm I'm not really into that. Like yeah, I was like yeah, it was whatever. I think they're just getting together and it's like just being awash and how powerful they are and just doing weird ritualistic stuff, but that that's kind of stuff might go down in Reverie, too. Like, they might have the meetings, but at the end of Reverie, they might be like, yes, let us burn this giant statue of Roger or something, and like, just, we're so great! We're so powerful! We're the rulers of the world! <laughs> Once again, totally could happen. These are a lot of messed up people. Anyway, so uh, we got a big celebration, though. There's gourmet food. The weapons have been confiscated, but all of the bodyguards of all the kings, they're looking pretty epic. We got a bunch of male suitors for Shirahoshi. You knew this was going to happen. A lot of uh, kings appear in front of Shirahoshi with their sons, and they're like, Oh, your beauty is absolutely stunning. My son here has not been married yet. Oh, would you be interested in him, Miss Shirahoshi? And so you have this one kid there that's just like, yeah, Papa, she's not bad, not bad at all. Shirahoshi ain't bad. Dude, you wouldn't even know what to do with Shirahoshi. I honestly don't know what to do. How do you have sex with a mermaid? Like, I'm just like legitimately, uh, this is a question that man has posed for literally hundreds of years. I still don't have an answer to this. I, I don't know. The next king comes up and he's like, oh no, marry my son. And this son is a little bit more just chubby in the face, kind of looks more like a tender Ubito, just like, Papa, I like her, I like her, I want her. And uh, 
<laughs> the way that they get turned down is a way that Shirahoshi turned down uh, Deccan, which just, uh, she's like staring at them for a little while and just kind of blushing, like, um, well, uh, you're just not my type. And every, they all get pissed because this is like, oh my god, you don't just, you, you can't just turn them down like you're doing it like at high school, you know, you're just not my type, please go away. And by the way, since we're on the subject of this, who is Shirahoshi's type? I w you might just say it's Luffy because she has a lot of admiration for Luffy, like that's the type of guy she's into, but I've never really got like a romantic vibe from Shirahoshi and Luffy. I feel like Shirahoshi just views him as a close friend and someone that's like her benefactor, like her savior, and you know, helped her get out of the castle tower. I never really saw a romantic thing going on with Shirahoshi and Luffy. If it is, it's not very explicit, I guess. Um, so I I'm not saying that, but I'm just like, what kind of type is she into? Yeah, that might be something that Oda might spin on its head later on in the story. Like, oh, that's the kind of guy she's into. Like, and she's into, um, maybe she's into giant men. Because, you know, she's so big already, maybe she's gonna fall in love with a giant or something. Because, like, you know, oh, I like guys that are taller than me, but that doesn't really come around very often, you know? Anyway, her, uh, brother Ryubo, she grabs her aside and says, No, Shirahoshi, you have to lie! She's like, I'm not good at lying, though! I was like, yeah, 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 but you have to just act like you're evading their questions because you can't just turn them down it could start a world war it could start an international incident just be like oh yes how thank you for your compliments maybe we could have dinner later and then you go and eat dinner and then you just never call them again after that that's how it works it's okay you just can't turn them down flat like that so Shiro, she has the the swirly eye going on she's like so good is the first time she's ever socialized really and there's all these rules she has to follow um you know i, I was hoping maybe someone could acute her up on what was actually happening what what to expect from the world nobles but um yeah she, she just she has no idea she just doesn't know she, she's like this level of innocence that they're not accustomed to but um anyway we then cut over to uh oh vivi hey how you doing wow you look cute oh my god vivi thinks i'm cute yes i have been validated no, she just meant freaking Leo. Yeah, the Tontadas get all the freaking love. But anyway, yeah, Vivi meets Rebecca and the Tontadas, and she's looking at, you know, Leo, and she has the reaction that, like, every other female character has to the Tontadas. Like, oh my god, you're so kawaii! And Leo, of course, has the uh, response that you would expect from a, a proud warrior like him. He's like, do not call me cute, madam! I fought in the Battle of Dressrosa! I slayed the She-Mountain Jola! <laughs> We lost a lot of people trying to take that hill. <laughs> there were sunflowers everywhere. <laughs> but no, yeah, seriously, he kind of relents and is kind of cool with it. He's just like, oh, well, cute. I mean, I mean, I am cute as well, but, you know. Also, nice little touch here that they added the straw hat symbol to uh, Leo's cap, the, the straw hat's Jolly Roger. I would say that would cause some controversy because he's in reverie and he's, like, brandishing out in the open a, a flag of a known pirate with a 1.5 billion berry bounty, but also consider they're really tiny, so I don't think anyone would notice, honestly. So, um, we have some trivia facts tr uh, trickled throughout this chapter, kind of the same thing we had with Steli in the last one. Because One Piece is such a long story and it's been around for over 20 years you know Oda's probably expecting that a lot of people either you know they forget or they're just getting into the story so they don't remember um so he actually has little trivia facts about okay here's the story revolving Vivi and how she's connected to the straw hats and what happened in Alabasta just a very brief overview and there's a few others of those throughout the chapter also something to bring up last chapter I made a mistake um was that uh in, in fact I said that Sabo's parents were killed and now uh, you know, Steli is the king. Sabo's parents were not actually the, the king and queen of uh, the Goa kingdom. And then you realize you, we never actually got to see the king and queen of the Goa kingdom. It was Prince uh, Princess uh, Nantucket. It was Steli's current wife. That was her parents were the king and queen. We just never met them. Um, Sabo's parents, Outlook the Third, they're still alive. It's just they were just normal nobles. So I felt like I should just mention that. I'll tell you the reason I got confused. It's because last chapter we saw this little panel here with Steli and Sabo's parents and then in the little caption it just mentioned that parents were killed so I guess I didn't read it too much I just saw that and said parents were killed and then there was a picture of Steli and Sabo's parents so I just immediately clicked it like oh that's what they were talking about but that's not actually what happened well okay so we get a brief overview of the Alabasta arc you know VV teamed up with the Straw Hats joined their crew, uh, crew briefly
briefly to go up against Crocodile and Baroque Works. Okay, that's awesome. So Vivi goes up to Rebecca and says, oh yeah, I read all about Dressrosa. I guess that Luffy just wanted to protect somebody else, you know, and then that was you guys. And then Rebecca kind of pauses. And then she turns around and she's bawling her eyes out. She's like, yes, he did. He was so great. I love Lucy. And it's like, can, can, we, oh, oh, can we still, you know, call him by his actual name? You know what his actual name is, Rebecca. But okay, fine. It, it's your little character quirk. We'll go with it. Um, at this point, Shirahoshi appears in front of all of them. Like, uh, oh, you guys talking about Luffy? But by the way, if the giant mermaid can hear you, you might want to just cue it down a little bit. You might want to be like, you know, just like, hey, do you know about Luffy too? I'll be like, ah, the Ixne on the Ushi K pirate a you, know, you, you don't want a bunch of people showing up around you with freaking like ah, are you discussing the pirate straw hat luffy as if he's your bestie like no and sure hoshi would be like yeah he's my best friend he rode on my back and punched a shark and somehow lit him on fire underwater it was an amazing weekend we had <laughs> So, maybe just dial it back down a little bit, Shirahoshi, alright? Well, obviously, Luffy's harem has assembled, and they're all discussing how awesome he is, and they're all good friends and everything like that, so they're gonna be good friends as well. Um, and um, even, like, Ryuboshi kind of goes up to Shirahoshi, though, and says, hey, just because they were talking about Luffy doesn't mean they're, her they're, they're his, like, close friends. So you gotta be careful about that, too, because imagine if this conversation was something else. Imagine there's, like, a king and, and another king... They're talking about, oh yeah, Luffy, that straw hat pirate. Did you hear his bounty is 1.5 billion? That's insane. That guy is a total. We need to find him. We need to kill him as quickly as possible. He's going to turn into a problem just like Roger did. And then Shirahoshi appears. Oh, are you talking about Luffy? Oh my god, I love him so much. He's such a great guy, you know? And then the king, like, uh, what? And then that's that's where stuff gets a little bit complicated. But yeah, so uh, Vivi, Rebecca, and Shirahoshi, they all seem like they're going to be getting along. Uh, there's a funny scene where Vivi and Rebecca are both giving the thumbs up. We sure do like Luffy. Um, so that was a cool scene. It's it's the, the harem has assembled. It's like I said, it's like the Avengers, except they're all Black Widows. And you might laugh about that and be like, oh, just, you know, Black Widow's way more badass than Vivi and Rebecca. Hey, they can still handle themselves in a fight. Vivi worked undercover in a criminal organization for like a year or two. She's got her peacock slasher. She's probably got hiding in her dress or in her cleavage she can whip out. Rebecca fought in the gladiatorial arena for God knows how many years. And, okay, granted, Shirahoshi's not much in a fight, but that kind of gets made up for when you consider she's an ancient weapon! So, um, yeah, or she could just smush people. That, that's something else she could do, too. So, yeah, it's like, yeah, we got, got the Avengers, yeah, the harem, the harem Avengers, yeah. All right, so uh, now we cut over to another new arrival. It's Sai from the Kano Kingdom and a member of the Straw Hat Grand Fleet, so... Hey, Sai, how you doing? Didn't bring Baby Five, unfortunately. Don't see her around. And we don't really get to see that many moments with Sai. Uh, but he, you know, talks to Leo because, of course, they're both sworn brothers of the Straw Hat Grand Fleet. So that was a cool moment. Like, ah, oh, Leo, how you doing, brother? He's like, Sai, where have you been? Uh, Rebecca comes up to him, too. So, yeah, the, everybody from Dressrosa remembers Sai. Um, and so Leo brings up, he's like, wait a second, though. You know, what are you doing here? You're allied with the Straw Hats. You're a pirate. And you're at Reverie. And, and, and Sai states... He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So after the reverie's over, after this whole thing's done, after I get back to my kingdom, I'm actually going to renounce connections to the Kano kingdom, and I'm just going to be a pirate full-time. So what Sai is actually doing here is actually kind of a smart move. So Sai is now the official leader of the Kano kingdom in the West Blue after what happened with Don Qingzhou, right? After Don Qingzhou was, you know, uh, Sai, you know, bent his his uh his head and he's like my my armament hockey is just as strong now if not stronger than you and don Xinjiao kind of passes down the uh the title as the leader of the hapo navy and of uh, the ruler of the kano kingdom okay B -b -b however However, Sai is, of course, also a member of the Straw Hat Grand Fleet. Now, how are you going to get around this? Well, he decides, you know, I'm going to attend Reverie first. Because Reverie is held, like, every four years. So, what would be smarter? To just cut ties with the, with the Kano Kingdom and just sail off and declare yourself a pirate right before Reverie happens? Or would it be, maybe be a smarter move to just, you know, bear the title for a little while, go to Reverie, you know, mingle. It's like, how you doing, 
King Taco. Oh yeah, I'm doing great. Yeah, Kano Kingdom's doing awesome. How's how's your kingdom? Oh great, it's awesome. Yeah, awesome. You know, mingle, do the meetings, learn about the world as much as you can, and then after this reverie is over, maybe wait a little while, and then like, all right, I'm renouncing ties to the Kano Kingdom because that way at least you have to wait another four years for the new reverie to occur. You know, and then this also might very well be the last reverie ever in the series uh, or in the world of One Piece, considering what what big events are going to happen next. I don't think we're going to have another one in four years. So, uh, yeah, that, that's what Sai is doing. I think it's a smart move to just kind of, like, deal with being a king for a little while, go to Reverie, and then cut ties after rather than before, because that could lead to a bunch of issues after that. Now, here is the big one I was waiting for, the big one, quite literally. A, a, a very large fat man arrives at Reverie, and lo and behold, it's Wapple with his trophy wife, Miss Universe. Oh, no, wait, she actually has a name. Awesome. It's Kinderella. Okay, that's kind of obvious where that's taken from. Obviously a playoff Sleeping Beauty, but yeah. So Wapple and Kinderella arrive, and we get Wapple's trivia talking all about- Oh, wait, 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 wait a second. Did he freaking call Vivi a damn hippo? Oh, it is on now, Wapple. It's on now. I'm gonna bazooka you down to the freaking Arctic. Here we go! Bam! No, but no, seriously, he's an asshole, and we all know that. So, uh, Wapple's trivia facts. Uh, well, he ruled Drum Island for a little while, then Blackbeard showed up, and that scared the crap out of him, and so he left, like the coward he is, and then he came back to the island later, and then Luffy bazookaed him so far, he landed in the South Blue. So, and then of course, using his uh, munch munch powers, his Baku Baku no Mi, he figured out that after consuming a bunch of trash, he can combine the different alloys and the metals together and make a new alloy called Wapo Metal, which also fun trivia fact, that's what the Frankie Shogun is made out of. It's like a shape retaining alloy. But using that alloy, he rose to prominence. He gained a, a huge empire like Wapo Corp he, he controls. He married the trophy wife, Miss Universe there, who just as every bit as conceited as he is, so I'm sure that marriage works great. And uh, he began a new country, the Evil Black Drum Kingdom, which I think evil is just in the title. Because every time we see it, Oda always makes a play to say, no, no, the actual title, it's not just the Black Drum Kingdom. No, the full title of this kingdom is the Evil Black Drum Kingdom. And and the world government still let him in. He's like, like I guess you have to apply for it. It's like, oh yeah, we started this new, uh, this new country. It's called the Evil Black Drum Kingdom. It's like, you'll fit right in. Stamp of approval. Invite to reverie. So yeah, Wapple's there, and he's starting shit with Vivi. Uh, remember the last time that Vivi was at reverie, Wapple, and she was 10 years old at the time, Wapple like slapped her upside the face and knocked her down. So I know Vivi is just dying to whip out some peacock and just slash him upside his freaking giant face. Um, but yeah, he's back, and uh, you know, Wapple, he wasn't one of my favorite villains, but it's just cool that Oda's going back and using these older characters, you know? It's not just like, okay, this character was defeated by Luffy, we're never gonna see him again. No, like, even the characters, like, like I'm still thinking that, like, Captain Morgan could show up later on in the story. Like, it's totally plausible, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, like, and remember what he did with, like, Django in Full Body? Like, they're members of the freaking Marines now. Well, Full Body was always a member of the Marines, but you know what, Django, like, these really minor villains that you think that, you know, they, they don't need to have further plot. You know, they're gone forever. Ever, but Oda keeps them around, and I like that. So they all start laughing at Vivi, and they make fun of her father. They's like, oh, uh, is Cobra in good health? I'm just kidding. I saw him earlier. He's in a wheelchair. He's probably going to die soon. Ah, idiot. His tongue is all over the place, and Kinderella's laughing. That's when Dalton shows up, along with Dr. Kareha and a giant lopin. They brought a lopin to Reverie. I don't know why I find that funny, I just do. That this giant, huge, grizzly, polar bear rabbit thing is just... Huh, huh. Like, okay, uh, well, here you go. Yeah, they have their back and forth, which I was waiting for for a while. Of course, Wapple is like, What the hell are you doing here, Dalton? Sakura Kingdom, what is this nonsense? And Dalton's just like, shut up, Wapple, you freaking idiot. Kareha's in the background sassing the crap out of him. She's just like, wow, I can't believe the world government let an idiot like you join. How do you even manage to run a company? Or a, or a country, for that matter. Honestly, Wapple probably doesn't do much. He probably has his own little team of evil 
black drum servants that run probably most of the day to day operations in the country. Um, but anyway, something else, a little fun fact about Kareha is the shirt she is wearing says Wanted 100 Berries, which is a reference to Chopper's Bounty. So she don't even care that it's such a low number. She's not embarrassed. She's gonna, she went out of her way to make a shirt to advertise her student, damn it. And that's also a clever way to advertise that you're a fan of the Straw Hats while being at Reverie without directly referencing it. Like, it would be one thing if she just had a picture of, like, Chopper's Wanted poster on her shirt, but that might, you know, like, why are you promoting a Straw Hat? But just Wanted 100 Berries? That kind of squeaks by. Also, this is about as good a time to mention it as any. Uh, we got some new shirt designs in the Teespring store I opened up. We got the Geography is Everything design, uh, with colored version one, and then we have the black and white Geography is Everything uh, shirts. So you can go check those over out on Teespring if you want to advertise that Geography is in fact the single most important thing in the world, but especially in the One Piece world. So links to that are below. Gotta get some shilling in at some point. Also, something else funny that I love is that when Wapple first saw Kareha and Dalton walk in, he's like, Dalton? Oh, and that old witch hag? You're still alive too? And Kareha, of course, she follows it up with her stick of like, asking me about my secret to internal youth. And of course, Wapple's like, no, I wasn't. But I was like, actually, you kind of were. Because this seemed very apt there. She's just like, oh, you're still alive? It's like, are you asking me how young I am? You know, I can tell you my secret. Someone should probably follow up on that. Someone should probably ask because, you know, I mean, Kareha, she's 141, which is a little older than kind of most people in the One Piece world. You could at least ask, like, yeah, I am interested on your secret to internal youth, Kareha. I, what, what do you do? Um, but anyway, yeah, Vivi then arrives, and she greets Dalton and Wapple. Remember, Vivi was present during the Drum Island arc there, so they remember each other. Kareha actually brings up, is like, hee hee hee, if I knew you were a princess back then, I would have charged you double for my medical fee. But then I start thinking, like, when did... Are you talking about the medical fee for Nami? Because I don't think Kareha ever operated on Vivi. Vivi uh, got shot when they arrived at Drum Island because they were afraid of pirates. So she got shot, uh, but they just, like, bandaged her up really quick. I don't think Kareha had to get involved there. So she might have been referring to the, the payment from, like, Nami's, um, you know, treatment. So that, that would be something there. Um, and then Wobble just gets directly up in Dalton's face. And Dalton's usually a pretty chill dude. He's really calm and reserved. You know, he's like, you know, Wobble, stop it. Stop being such a douche. You've always been like this. But this was the point where Dalton snaps, when Wobble's getting right up in his grill. Like, you're just a lowly retainer. How dare you tell me to stop? Off. That's when Dalton's cutting the bullshit, and he just turn, he goes into his um, half bison form, and he just gets right in Wapple's ground. He's like, "You and I are the same rank now." And he he doesn't pull out his like big you know sword shovel thingy, but he's just like he's like, "Don't start." I will kick your ass this time, right up and down the red line, all right? I'm not dealing with your crap anymore. So, yeah. Uh, Dalton, he, he piss him off. He's a gentle giant. Piss him off, he will he will wreck you. Remember that time he straight up decapitated Wapple? Yeah, that's another kind of WTF moment in, in One Piece, okay? In the anime, he just takes out his little, you know, sword shovel thing. I don't know what the hell that thing's called. And he does, like, the fiddle horn thing, and he slices Wapple upside the chest. And the, the, the Ishi 20, the doctors come out and patch him back up and he's fine. But in the manga, it's a straight up decapitation. He just shows up and just, ah! Oh! And then the doctors patch him back together and he's like, oh, I thought I almost died there. Good thing I have doctors to stitch my head back on. <laughs> that... That was, I could see them changing that in the anime, not just for censorship, but also because, like, wow, that, even by One Piece standards, that really didn't make a lot of sense. Um, but anyway, yeah, that, 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 that did happen. Right, so after that moment, Dalton pretty much just ignores Wapple. He's ranting in the background, going on and on and on about how, you know, you can't be a proper king because you're too much of a pacifist. You know, you're going to learn pretty much that soon enough the, the kingdom is going to be ruined and you got to resort to doing underhanded tag. Bro, 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 bro. Dalton's going over to Vivi and just talking about Luffy. He's like, oh, I heard you talking about Luffy-san. And uh, Vivi mentions, like, oh, are you a fan of Luffy too, Dalton? Meanwhile, Wapple is still like, rah, 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 
Rama, Rama. But uh, Dalton just kind of like turns his head, and you don't get to see it, but he's blushing. So that that's that's a cute scene there from Dalton there. Uh, we also get Dalton's trivia and Kareha's trivia. Not really much to add here. Dalton is the now current king of the Sakura Kingdom. Used to be a retainer to, to Wapple. I've already mentioned this. And Kareha, I think we already know about Kareha. I mean, I made a video about her. I could throw it up there if you want to watch that. But uh, yeah, Kareha is just the teacher of, of Chopper. So there you go. Okay, so now we're moving on to the last scene of the chapter. Like I said, not a lot of, not like a really big moment in this chapter, you know? Nothing like huge. Like we don't get the introduction of the Gorosei or anything. We don't see Green Bull or anything. It's just, you know, okay, Vivi, Rebecca, Wapple, you know, Kinderella, then Dalton and Kareha, they all arrive and then like how their dynamic works with each other. Shirahoshi, Vivi, and Rebecca, they all meet up. We knew that was going to happen. So, okay. Um, but now we cut away to, uh, oh, level six impal down. Okay, that's what the. Oda, you gotta be careful when you're throwing those transitions in, okay? You're giving me way too much hype. I don't know how to adjust to this. Okay. So, level six impel down, <laughs> where we have Doflamingo, yeah, chilling out down there. He's chained to the freaking floor. And uh, uh, keep in mind, by the way, when Crocodile and Jinbei were in prison there, and even when Ace was in prison there, they kind of just chained them to the walls a little bit. In fact, I think Crocodile was able to freely roam around his cell. They kept they kept Jinbei chained to a wall, and they kept Ace just shackled with his um, with his handcuffs. Although no, he might have been chained to the wall too. Anyway, Doflamingo is straight up like bolted to the floor. Like he is just covered in karyoseki and he is just chained down to the floor constantly. Like, so he is like in the solitary confinement section of level six. And we don't get to see him, unfortunately, but Magellan is also present. And um, Doflamingo's like, <laughs> so Magellan, you, uh, you protecting me? Because you're, 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 Magellan is apparently watching Doflamingo. I would, I would imagine like right outside of his cell, Magellan is just kind of sitting down on a chair and, and you know, Doflamingo's trying to talk to him like, you know, so... Uh, have they arrived yet? Those assassins from up above that are trying to kill me. So, from what we can understand here, Doflamingo, of course, being a celestial dragon at one point, having a bunch of stuff to blackmail the Tenry Ubito, uh, we've already known this, but we didn't know the particulars necessarily. Now we're starting to kind of see them. One of the things that he did have up his sleeve that he could use to blackmail the world nobles if they ever tried to mess with him uh, and why they always kind of seem to listen to him is because Doflamingo knows the secret location of a certain treasure that's located in the Holy Land, okay? The problem is, he's not a Tenry Ubito, officially. He's a pirate now, and he's imprisoned in Impel Down, and the people high up are probably worried that he's gonna blab this to everybody in the prison, or just, no, like, this is something like super top special secret. Like, nobody's supposed to know about this. Like, even Magellan, who works for the world government, even the other prisoners who are locked away, the, the probably the Tenry Ubito and the Goro say they're probably like, no, 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 no. Kill him. We need to kill him quick, because nobody can learn about this secret. This is probably like one of the carefullyest guarded secrets only the Gorosei and like the Tenryu Bicho are supposed to know about that. This is the level of secrecy we're talking about here, like next level top secret classified shit. So, he figures that they're probably going to send assassins to sneak into Impel Down. Maybe they'll pose as guards or whatever, like a transfer or something. Because even the Marines are probably not going to be part of this. This is probably going to be an old, you know, world government, top echelon sort of thing. And so Magellan is down there guarding him because Magellan is still very loyal to his own convictions. You know, he's now the Vice Warden, but he's probably like, yeah, I'm not going to... I'm not going to let, you know, the world government just barge into my prison and kill whoever they, they wish, you know. Because remember, Magellan got pissed off when Shiryu was doing that. When Shiryu was just going around the prison just slaughtering prisoners. And he's like, who, who cares? They're just prisoners. I can do whatever I want with them. Magellan was like, no, I'm putting a stop to this. So Magellan, probably, he's very convicted to this. So he's just like, you know what? I know you're the scum of the earth. But this is my, this is, well, not my prison anymore, but, you know, it's, it, it, it's still his prison, let's be honest here. It's, it's my prison. Um, I'm not going to let, you know, assassins come down here and try to kill you, because that's, that's just not the way we do things in Impel Down. But, uh, yeah, that is, that is pretty intimidating, the fact that the World Nobles would probably send somebody, even though he's secure in level 6, they're like, no, not good enough. The eternal hell where their, their existence is supposed to be erased from the world, not good enough. He needs to die. Now, granted, there was also a massive breakout of level six just a few years ago, so that might also, like, uh, if Luffy was able to get out with all these people, with Crocodile and Jinbei, 
Dofi might be able to get out to. We might want to kill him before that happens, because if he breaks free and he's running around the world again, and he just starts blabbing to everybody. But in terms of the actual secret of the treasure itself, we don't know what it is in this chapter. Odo would not reveal it this quickly, or the nature of it, but he does mention that it's like, who even cares? He's like, <laughs> shouldn't it be okay for me to mention what this treasure is? Power degrades anyway, just like that and it rots away into nothingness. So the treasure involves something uh, with power, something that ha somebody that has this treasure garners great power. Mm, I don't know if he meant that in the literal sense, like it's a great weapon or a devil fruit or something, or in just the, the sense of power to rule. So, we cut back over to Marijois, the Holy Land, where we see a shadowy figure. It's not Green Bull. We see a shadowy figure walking along into the, the, the dark hallways of the castle, a place, a place that nobody probably is allowed except, like, the highest nobility. We see him walking down a stairwell, and we see him going into a vault that's frozen, so the entire inside of this vault area is just a freezer, just a massive freezer. He's walking into a particular room, He's carrying two wanted posters in his hands. One of the wanted posters we see very clearly. It's Luffy's updated wanted poster with the 1.5 billion. The other wanted poster we do not see. We have no idea whose it is. The last scene of the chapter, he approaches a giant straw hat kept in this freezer. So there's frost all over it. It looks exactly like Luffy's with the same band, just a lot bigger, sitting on what seems to be... A coffin or a, a sarcophagus or something because there's like a line right here and the fact that it's kept in a freezer hints at preservation so a lot of people are freaking out over the hat like seriously like all day I was just like what's with the hat what's with the hat the hat the hat the hat Okay, the hat is not a big deal. I guarantee you the hat itself, the hat itself, I know exactly where it's come from. I, I, and, and you guys really should too, because we've seen something like this before. I'm not, I'm not talking about Luffy's. Okay, um, okay. Remember rock and scotch? There you go. Wait, you, you don't remember rock and scotch? How could you forget Punk Hazard, the Yeti Cool Brothers, yo! You know, these giant brothers that are also abominable snowmen who were wearing straw hats. And they were giants, so they had to be giant straw hats. And they lived on Punk Hazard, which was half an Arctic wasteland, so it was freezing. So I think it's pretty obvious that this is the casket of their long-deceased older brother. So you had Rock, Scotch, and their older brother, Bagosh. There you go! Pretty simple, actually. Now, what is Bagosh going to do? Okay, now seriously. Now, uh, the straw hat, look. This, is always, this has always been a huge symbol of the series. Go watch my video on the meaning of the straw hat, where I delve into that. Now, I'll tell you, this did throw me for a loop, because it's, it's a different straw hat. The straw hat that we've always assumed is Luffy's, was also wielded, also worn by Roger, because Roger, we saw him wearing a hat, and then he purportedly passed that down to Shanks, and then Shanks passed it down to Luffy. And that still is the case, because this hat we see here is huge. And I know somebody might bring up, it's like, well, maybe the hat's not huge. Maybe that guy holding the posters, maybe he's uh, just really tiny. Okay, then, um, how do you explain the size difference between the hat and the wanted posters, then? Uh, unless he got his hands on really tiny wanted posters. No, no, they're, 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 he's a normal-sized guy. He's just really tall and lanky. Honestly, I thought that Ice King went on a diet or something. But no, we don't know who this strange character is with a very lean frame and the crown. Um, but yeah, he's normal-sized, relatively. We see the size of the wanted posters in comparison, so this hat is huge. Now, it's being kept in a giant freezer. Why would you keep a straw hat in a giant freezer? Well, I can't really see much of a reason for it um, other than just to preserve it to to make sure it doesn't decay, and Doflamingo was talking about decay, but also think about if this is really a sarcophagus or a coffin, that would make perfect sense, okay? Let me set the stage for you guys. The Holy Land of Marijois. It's been around for 800 years. It's been around probably even since uh, before the Void Century. We don't know how long the actual city has existed for. It might have been maybe over a thousand years old. We don't know. The Void Century happens. We don't know what happened during the Void Century, but... A lot of people died. A lot of people. 
and the world government wants to make damn ding dong sure that nobody finds out what happened and what do you think they would do with the bodies of the people like um like let's say joy boy joy boy is the only like, the only person we know that existed in, in the void century and we don't even know if that was his real name but imagine what they would do with all the other people that they that killed they, they killed and they didn't want around anymore I mean, yeah, they could just, you know, burn their bodies and be done with it, but there also seems to be a running trend of keeping things around from that time period for a reason. Remember the Noah? The Noah was just this giant ship that nobody really paid that much attention to, but it was something very important. Um, that needed to be around for that time. So it's possible that the world government, for some reason, we don't know why, could not just get rid of these bodies from back then. They actually needed to preserve them for something. Uh, we don't know what that something is, but they just couldn't get rid of their bodies. So I'm assuming that way back in the day, it could have been Joy Boy, it could have been somebody else that we've just never been introduced to, was the uh, the, the head of the D family, of, of the, the bearers of the will of D, the guy that started it. All right, and he just happened to wear a straw hat too. And it's this weird fucking thing where all of these people in the world that are causing all these problems like Roger and Shanks and Luffy, and, and they just happen to wear a freaking straw hat. And this person here, the, the freaking uh, the Ice King on Atkins or whatever, he's like, I can't believe that this is happening again somebody with the exact same initial and the exact same hat and he felt nostalgic for this and he went into this top secret vault freezer freaking tomb area and went up to the tomb of the person that originated the D-Clan who was being kept in that sarcophagus right there and as sort of like a memorial to them they stuffed his dead body in this place froze it and then took his hat which he's become famous for and then rested it on the top of a coffin there you go i think that makes sense now there's a lot of freaking gaps in all that stuff i just said because oda's kind of teasing us here he's just kind of twisting the nipple a little bit just like yeah check it out bet you try to figure out what that means later oda out although i'll give it to you he didn't say break next week so Good job, buddy. Although we're probably not going to get touched upon. We're not going to touch upon this in the next chapter. We're probably not going to touch upon this for a while. Um, but yeah, that's that's my idea. That the the thing that you should be paying attention to is not so much the straw hat. It's what the straw hat is resting on, which does. There's a line through it which looks like it's a sliding sarcophagus like what the Egyptians would seal their dead in like you push this off and there's a body in there and the reason it's so cold is to preserve the body the way it was when it died so it's not skeletal no idea whose body it was or whatever now in relation to what doflamingo was talking about with power i have no idea but uh, maybe it has something to do with the actual bodies like they're keeping the body around for a reason um maybe because they could use the body of the person i i okay listen 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 i'm just using this as an example i'm not saying it's going to be the exact same thing okay just an example okay in Naruto, you know, Hashirama, and they keep reproducing Hashirama cells, like just his body itself was something that could give immense power to people. So that's why they kept him or they kept reproducing him and everything, like what like Obito and, and Madara did, okay? I'm just using that as an example, but it might be something like the actual physical body of this person that began the D-Clan has a power in and of itself that the world government is trying to keep and harness. So they can't just kill the guy and then burn his corpse. Like, no, let's keep that around. Maybe it might be something like trying to revive them. This is pretty much like what Moria did back on Thriller Bark. Keep bodies frozen and preserved until he got a shadow powerful enough to revive them, like he did with Ors. So it might be something like that. Keep the body preserved. Maybe someday technology will improve to the point where we could bring them back. Now, in our world, of course, bringing back a body that's been dead for 800 years just because it was stuffed in an icebox makes zero sense. But this is the One Piece world where someone could be decapitated and then their head could just be patched back together. So I think that that would make perfect sense. Although that does kind of bring up the point whereas they could have maybe just used the shadow powers of Moria when he was a, a warlord to revive this person. But once again, this might have been like a top secret thing. They did not want anybody else to know except for the higher echelons of the government in the Tenry Obito, and that is it. So... Those are my thoughts on what the hell is going on here. As for the actual person, I have no idea. A character we've never met before, but probably would have some connections. Hey, this guy here, here's an idea. 
Is there a supreme ruler, like a king, amongst the Tenryubito? The Tenryubito are, in fact, the descendants of the world government, yeah. But there's certainly some of them, like Charlos, that are just idiots that don't care about political events, and there's others that do. Could there be a definitive, like, king of the world government? An official noble that maybe refers a lot of stuff, like he defers a lot to the Gorosei for like his council, but in terms of like an actual king king, could that person exist? That could be that person right there. So those are my thoughts on the matter. Uh, I really enjoyed this chapter. Hope you guys did too with the reunions with all the characters we haven't seen in so long. And the ending here with Doflamingo and uh, the hat threw me for a loop in a big way. So I hope to see your thoughts on that below. And I'm probably going to make a video about it, referring to it at some point. So yeah, stick around for that. And uh, check out my store with the new Geography is Everything shirts and the other chibi shirts that are available as well by Andy Pleiades. So check those out if you're into that. Link to all that stuff is here in the end screen. So uh, have a great day, everybody. Signing out.